Hello? So today we are, I'm going to show you about putting trust into OpenStack. And I'm from Cloud Scaling. I'm Eric Windish. I am an OpenStack developer, and I've been building cloud computing things for a very long time. Uh, before we really were calling things cloud, we've been doing automation for longer than that. And that's my Twitter handle. Uh, again, cloud scaling. So. so attacking Grizzly should be scary. We want to make it so that you, <laughs> right, attacking Grizzly should be a scary thing. We, we don't want to make it easy for you to do it. So we want to do this by adding trust to the system. And to put trust in, we need to understand what trust is. So trust is knowing who your friends are, right? Trust in computing is not different than trust in real life. You have to know who your friends are. You need to know how to identify who those friends are. You need to be able to know when someone is trying to fool you into saying there's someone else. You, know, you don't want identity fraud. But trust is limited. Trust is not, um, it, it's, it's not without limits. You just, you, you can't trust everyone and you can't trust them completely. So you have to know how much you can trust each of those friends. And trust is not necessarily encryption. So we will use uh, cryptography but we do not need necessarily to have encryption to have trust. You do need, for instance, say message signing, but encryption, while it can provide the trust that we're looking for, is not a requirement for the trust that we're looking for. So right now in OpenStack, the system is wide open. Anyone can send messages anywhere through the RPC messaging bus. If you can get, if you are a, a system in a data center and you're on the network, you can send a message to any of the systems and control them. If you are, say, we, we have customers and they, I think every person, every customer has some sort of out of band way to get into the system. You have operations people. Operations people need to be able to manage these systems. At some point, they are going to be able to get into that network and do things. They need to, do, need to have that for their jobs. But what happens when their system is compromised and they're coming through the VPN? What happens when one of your other systems somehow gets compromised? And you have these backdoor ways to get in, and anyone can send messages in control OpenStack. Say, for instance, compute. You can destroy someone else's VMs or create VMs just because you want to, you want to avoid billing controls or constraints or control networking, which is even scarier because you can do all kinds of nasty things, uh, sending packets where you don't want them going. And then there's the impossible things, the things that we design that shouldn't happen but do happen, like the hypervisor gets compromised and, well, you know, you have the security model that plans that the VMs can't do certain things, but sometimes VMs can do certain things. You might have a flaw in your networking model. There might be in your virtual switching or your real switching or your access control groups. And when those impossible things happen, we need to be able to protect against, against that eventuality. So there is an ability right now, say, to use TLS, SSL against RabbitMQ. And it's not enough, because when you use that, you have trust between each of the endpoints and the RabbitMQ server, which decrypts those messages and then re-encrypts them to the other host. And it's not point to point. There's no identity trust from one end of the system to another. It's only trusting that messages are to and from RabbitMQ and not from any specific system. So if we want to implement things like role-based access controls. We can't do that with just a trust in Rabbit. And also, it's a point of entry, too. So somebody could actually do a man-in-the-middle attack there. Uh, RabbitMQ is based on Erlang. Somebody could even actually modify the code without shutting down a the service. They can just modify it in real time or in process. 
So we need to have secure messaging from point to point. And again, anyone right now can inject a message. You have the malicious Malin who is going to send a message pretending he's Nova Scheduler. And he can do that right now. Just create a message, put it out there, and Nova Compute will pick it up and it will process it and it will do something that it shouldn't do based on input from someone it does not trust. And it can't verify it. And likewise, because that can happen, you can also have man-in-the-middle attacks. Your switching infrastructure or your routing infrastructure could be compromised, and someone could actually remove a message and replace it with another one. So what we want to have is trust. We put these locks, keys, on Nova Scheduler, and it uses that to sign the message that gets put over the transport, and no matter what is in the middle, where that message goes over, when it gets to the other end, we know it came from that scheduler, and that Nova Compute can trust that no matter over what medium that message arrived, that that message, in fact, did come unmodified from the Nova scheduler. And when we do this, when the malicious mallard tries to inject a message and he doesn't have trust, we don't know who he is, he can't sign the message. So when we have a secure node on the, on the opposite end here, the receiver, the consumer, and he receives a message that's not signed, he doesn't know who it's coming from, or it, the message is just not from the trusted system, we just reject it. It doesn't go anywhere. It's not accepted. And that prevents that attack. And likewise, it prevents that man-in-the-middle attack. Those messages cannot be modified. They're, they're created and they're static. And if they're changed, it will be detected and will stop those, thing, those attacks from occurring. So we need to be able to implement this. There's many protocols. There's many ways of doing this, uh, some good, some bad. And you hear a lot of suggestions on which way you should or shouldn't do it. Um, the, the, the three main algorithms that one would consider are SSL, HMAC, and RSA. SSL is one I hear a lot, but it's, a, it's complex. So that's sometimes a good thing. When we have the web, SSL between endpoints is great because you have all these different clients. You have mobile browsers, and you have legacy browsers. You have, you have Chrome, and Firefox, and Internet Explorer. And they all support different protocols. They all have a different implementation. So SSL is complex in order to support this uh, heterogeneous environment. But in OpenStack, we have a homogeneous environment. All of the systems are the same. They're all running the same software. We know what they can and cannot support. So we don't need a complex solution. And SSL is session-based. So by being session-based, it means that we are going to, first of all, have to maintain state, and we're going to have to send messages back and forth to negotiate the communication before we can send that message. When we do that, it works against the model that we have in Nova, which is a simple messaging pattern. Messages go from one plate from A to B. If we had a session, we have to go A, B, A, B, A, B. Okay, now we can <laughs> send the original message that was going from A to B. And then probably a few more messages to take it all apart. So again, overly complex with being session-based. But SSL is great because you use PKI which we want because we need that for our identity. Um, it uses encryption, which is not actually really a minus, but it's not a requirement for what we need. And it, because it uses PKI, we can use the TPM with it. Good thing. So HMAC, simple, really simple. People say, okay, well, you know, we have HMAC in Python and it's uh, part of the core library and it works. 
Well, it's a shared key. So with a shared key, first of all, you can make sure that the message is coming from a system with an open stack. That is only so good to make sure that that message comes from a system within OpenStack. It does not assure that it's any specific type of machine. It doesn't assure that we, we can't do key re re revocation with that. If a key system gets compromised, we can't just remove it from the pool and stop taking its messages. It simply, you know, it's theoretically simple, but then really you find out that to get the security that you want, you need to use Diffie-Hellman, which is session-based. So now we're back to what we had with SSL. And to get that identity, you have to also pair it with PKI. But yeah, well, okay, it's signing. So you know, it's, it's faster uh, than encryption, which is good. And it's all we really need. So um, I, I have circle here, RSA. And it's simple. It's stateless. It's PKI. Message signing, which is faster than encryption. It's all, and again, all we need. And compatible with the TPM. So we, we kind of get these advantages of something that we can do of HMAC and SSL without the problems of, of either. So I, I keep getting asked, how are you going to manage these keys? And key management is a fairly complex thing. So I, I actually don't think that it has to be as difficult as people suggest. It's, this is actually a fairly standard RSA encryption based layout. You have an, an, a CA, you have a service key up in the left hand, upper left hand corner, um, you create a signing request, and you have a CA sign that to get a certificate. This is exactly what you do today with your SSL certificates that you get from VeriSign. What will change is that when you are running an OpenStack cloud with message signing, you will need to have your own CA and not just reply on one from, say, VeriSign or one of these other large certificate authorities. You'll have your own CA in your, in your cloud deployment that will be the, uh, the point of authority for the system. And then everything else actually looks a lot like your SSL solution today. So how you get those keys out there, how you implement the, the message, uh, the key signing and everything would be based on the tools that you use to manage those certificates in SSL today. And if you don't have those tools, then you get those as part of your, yes, um, the microphone. Um, you could theoretically, you know, use your own, right, so I'll, I'll get to that in a bit. So, right, so, you know, you, you'd have to have that whole distributing those keys, signing those keys as part of your distribution, as part of your deployment mechanism, but again, not really any different than SSL today, where we have those same problems. So, we are going to sign messages, uh, and we're going to change the message format that's in OpenStack now. We have a, so right now we have the, the version one uh, down here on the lower left corner. We have uh, three fields that are sent over the message bus. There, we have a, we, we want to add a version two of the messaging, which will add a time to live and a timestamp. We want these anyway. These are things that we are already know we want to have in the OpenStack messaging bus. So we're going to add those to the version two RPC. And those are important for encryption or for signing. We need that to prevent replay attacks. So that just because somebody created a message at some point doesn't mean that we can just you know, keep repeating that message. So with the timestamps, we can actually say, well, this message was sent too long ago. There was a max time to live on that message. It is passed, and we're no longer going to accept it. Unfortunately, within that, there is a window in which messages could be repeated. So it's not perfect, but the only ways to avoid that or to have the session-based things that we already discussed would not really work out so well for us. Um, 
but also this is pluggable. So if you wanted to have, say, a third-party system like Zookeeper or something that made sure that messages were never getting repeated, you could plug that in. But by default, we're just going to assume that those timestamps are going to be sufficient and there will be a small window in which replays could happen, but not pure fraudulent messages. And then we add the signature chain. So the signature chain will be an optional parameter. The, the parameter will always be there, uh, but if you're not using message signing, if you are not forcing it, then it will be blank. It will be a null field. And because it's pluggable, because people are going to want to have their own CA mechanisms. Some people, uh, I was speaking with Red Hat, and they want to, Red Hat has a CA solution, and they want to use theirs. Uh, I think you know, HP may even have something. Uh, you know, I know cloud scaling, we're talking about doing our own system as well as part of our distribution. So what we want to have is we're going to identify the variant of the signature. So someone was saying the message format is actually designed, in theory, you could not use RSA, you could use something else. You could figure something else out with this. I think RSA makes sense and it's what we're going to implement as part of the OpenStack uh, Grizzly patch, but it is not the, but you could theoretically implement something else here. And you would identify that via the variant identifier. Then you have the variant specific fields which are generally going to be a signature and a public key identifier. So you can have something like an ASM1 or so forth that identifies a public key that you look up in a key server and that way you can verify that certificate of the host. So sending the certificate the certificate in every message would be really, really heavy. So that's why we want to use an identifier in the external CA system. There have been some discussions that some people may want to, at least for small deployments for just getting it to work and making it work easy, we may want to make an option that you can put the whole X509 key uh, public uh, certificate into the message as well, which would simplify the security um, attack surface, but would also make the messages significantly bulkier. And the great thing about making this pluggable is that you have that flexibility to do it one way or another way. And to integrate your own, you know, as vendors like, say, Cloud Scaling or Red Hat or uh, HP could put in their own things and make it part of their distribution and make it easy for the users so that they don't have to worry too much about how this all works. So, I still have a lot of time. Um, so I'm actually going to skip a couple slides. I have some extra slides. So, one, one thing we could do here too is, th this is kind of theoretical, is to extend this stuff to the database. Because the database is also a problem where we can in inject things. If you compromise a system, such as the API server, you can just put things into the database. You can read things in the database. And grants are not enough. If you look like on Stack Forge or whatever these, you know, um, server fault, you'll find people asking, oh, how do I do per column grants in MySQL and make it secure? And you'll find that actually people don't have these answers. People don't know how to do uh, column, you know, properly column-based access restrictions on the database. Doing row-based is just impossible. So, right now, you you know, our malware can inject messages into SQL. He can read things out of SQL. He can do whatever he wants. So, we can actually do an RPC DB uh, as something that we're kind of experimenting with. We're not promising this for Grizzly. And. If we did this, then we extend trust to a centralized source that does do SQL, and we minimize the input and output. So you can make a query based on information. You can actually say, well, this compute node only has actually access to these rows of the database. And he only gets the, the return value of the function. And here, if you you know, have someone faking a message, you know, again, it gets blocked and he can't access the database at all. So not only do we prevent someone from actually connecting to the database that we don't want to connect to the database, we can also limit 
what comes out of the database, even for those that we do trust, right? So we don't have unlimited trust. We have limited trust only to the things that we want them to have access to. So, um, I have plenty of time for questions. So, we are hiring. Uh, we're in San Francisco. <laughs> and uh, I like to think, um, do we have the microphone? Yeah. yeah, thanks. Question on that last point. Were you thinking of having the scope, that is the, the scope that the uh, trusted principal has access to? Did you think of having the scope carried in the actual message exchange? Sorry, I mean, the scope? In other words, you said that, that I can um, authenticate that this is the trusted entity that's, that's trying to access the database, but then you want to limit which data in the database they have access to. How right. did you associate that um, authorization to that scope of data with that user? Right, so I believe the question is, if you receive a request, say you have a function that's processing in that that SQL alchemy code, how do we actually know that it was this Nova Compute instance in that code? How do we get it from the trust mechanism into the, into the SQL layer? Is that, am I, am I understanding, am I translating it? Right. Okay. So, uh, one thing to keep in mind too is so, all of these requests um, carry a context with them, which is has a signed token that comes from Keystone. So there's already actually a, a the, the scope that you're referring to is actually already is inside of the message that we're transporting, and that has a token from Keystone. But that token from Keystone is even though we, that's trusted, so we trust that this is coming from an author, we may trust that it's coming from an authorized user at the very end, but that, that token could actually be duplicated and attached to a different message where you could do something else. So um, combining this with the keystone, I think, gives you what you're, lo you're requesting. Right, cause, yeah, because the, the, the keystone token would also then be signed. Right, so yeah, there, there was a slide on that. And uh, right here. So, right, so what could happen is, first, first of all, if you're using RabbitMQ, there is a messaging fabric. Uh, so I'm gonna repeat the question for people online. Have we considered securing the messaging fabric as opposed to end-to-end? -end? And there are a few problems with this. One is that you have a central point that encrypts and decrypts all the messages, which there is now an unencrypted form, and theoretically, you know, somebody could get into that system, the RabbitMQ server, into the messaging system, and actually do a man-in-the-middle attack there. Additionally, it doesn't give us role-based access controls. So I didn't show a lot of role-based access control information here because we're not going to do that in Grizzly. We're going to likely do that in the H, the following release. But this lays a foundation for us to do role-based access controls. Right. Okay. Uh, so the question was if we can use access controls inside RabbitMQ, and. Yes, you can do things like that, but I've had some conversations with uh, some of the other people in the security uh, side who are using RabbitMQ and they've been trying to do that, and it only kind of works, and there are still, it's still not as robust as this. So additionally, cloud scaling is using zero MQ, and we're actually doing point-to-point -point messaging. So we don't have a single point of failure, we don't have a single point of intrusion to the system that those messages could then be uh, compromised with the man-in-the-middle attack. 
which would still, by the way, still happen in that case. So you can do access controls, and you can trust RabbitMQ, and but we're putting a lot of trust in one basket, and that host is still a host that can get compromised. Uh, with the model that we're proposing here, even if RabbitMQ was compromised, even if all, the, all those access controls in RabbitMQ, which, by the way, are good things to have, we can also do that. It won't hurt anything to have it as well. Then those messages can still not be duplicated. They can still not be replaced, and we can still have access controls based on roles from end to end. No, no, we should not trust RabbitMQ. That is correct. Right. So, so the question is, if you know you compromise a scheduler, you can still g gain access to the system, and for short time, yes. So the idea is that if a scheduler is compromised and messages are getting inserted into the system, that we can detect that and we can revoke that key, and we can remove it from the pool. We also would have to link this into an audit trail and then you know, see what actually happened. And because we have identity now, we can actually see that it was actually the messages coming from that compromised system during that period of time that we knew it was compromised that we can actually now try, trace that back. Yes, yes, so every system will have a unique identity. So let's say you use the TPM module. The TPM, mo the TPM will generate your private key in a chip, and you only get back your certificate signing request back for which you generate your certificate. You don't ever get access to your own key. You can't just, you wouldn't want to just copy a private key around between all your Novo compute machines, all your schedulers. You would have an identity per host. Right, yeah, right, so again here, so you have, well, on the, on the picture here, we have the, you know, the, the, the hop style SSL, but it's not end-to-end. -end, um, no, but the message that you see here is end-to-end. -end. Okay. Right. Right, I mean, I mean, you can do SSL to rabbit and do signing from endpoint to endpoint. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes, and you can also do access controls on the queues. So if you, you know, want to do that, you can do all of that, and... I'm not saying that's bad. I mean, right, right. So I, I I think that those things will probably be unnecessary with this, but they're also available for you to do if you really want to you know chain a bunch of things together. And I think this will be a vendor differentiation where our vendors will be able to provide working key management systems. And I spoke with the Keystone folks. So one of the plugins that we discussed in depth would be a Keystone-based uh, key management system. So we can actually put keys into Keystone. And we could do that fairly easily and easy and low cost. And by doing that, we could have something that works out of the box and is actually very secure. It may not be the most scalable, uh, depending on how you feel about scaling Keystone, but it's something we could do out of the box for a pretty decent key management solution. Well, well, Keystone doesn't have to authenticate that node. You just query Keystone for a public key. That public key is signed by a CA that you trust. So the message, you could actually get that information from Keystone without even SSL between you and Keystone. And the fact that you're getting that public key in the clear is fine because it's signed. Right. 
Uh, I think I had another question. So, okay. Okay, so it's, the, the keys are per host, obviously, but you can actually identify it by services. So you can actually have a different private key per service per host. But those, those keys are per host, but they can be per service as well, uh, if that makes sense. Like, you wouldn't, you wouldn't say have a single private key for all Nova computes, but you, if, a serv if a server's running multiple services, it could have multiple keys and one for each service. No, 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 no. The fact that we're using OpenSSL means that you could optionally put keys in TPM. So this, I'm not saying you have to use it. I'm saying, like, it's an advantage that we have an architecture that it's available to us. Right, so, right, so we're going to have a uh, certificate revocation list and you know, the actual architecture for how that's going to work is still kind of pending. Um, you know, we're kind of talking here more about, you know, the message format and so forth that are going to facilitate those things. So that's an easy extension to what we're doing. Yes. Yes. Right, but, right, but I mean, this, you know, is no different than other, you know, PKI systems, even SSL, where you, you have a very similar thing, right? Your web browser needs to have a certificate revocation support in order to understand that, you know, some key from some authority was revoked. And Yes, yes, which is why we're, it's, we're making a pluggable and allowing vendors to provide solutions around it. Right, yeah, exactly. We have, you know, you know a more, some, some vendor can say we have a better CA system than another. I mean, you know, cloud scaling, you know, has, you know, our own ideas on how to do this, uh, and I know other vendors do as well, and this is where we're going to be able to differentiate and pr provide value add around it. I have a question in the back. How do you uh, pull those from other organizations? Um, not so much. Uh, one of the problems is that, you know, we, we are doing this over a messaging bus, right? We're not doing this so around. Um, I mean, do, do you have a problem with the model that's proposed? Well, it's written expressly that we want to implement it in a consolidated system. It has, but I don't have, you know, the arguments to, to give you now, and we can take that offline. Um, I think we're just about at lunchtime, so uh, if there's any last questions. So, yeah, I, mean, I don't feel like we're reinventing something because we're using a really simple primitive, right, of RSA. We're just taking simple RSA and we're putting it into messages. It's actually quite simple. Um, OpenStack is going to have to have configuration and opt in, you know, in configuration of uh, variables and so forth to understand this stuff. So we're still going to have to re reinvent those plugins to the system. So I, I, you know, and we're just using very simple primitives for the, for the, for the encrypt, for the signing. I believe the fellow team.
Right, so, okay, so if a system is compromised, then the private key can be potentially used um, for a limited amount of time. It may even be stolen, but if you're, if you're using a TPM, then the key cannot be stolen. It can only be used. And you can restrict how it's used or if it can be used with things like SE Linux and so forth um, that provide access constraints on, in the user space. Uh, and beyond that, you know, we have key revocation, so you can take those, those keys out. Uh, I do think we're out of time. Uh, I think lunch is uh, behind you. So thank you very much. <laughs>